Welcome to Slash Forward. In this episode, we're going to take all our lycanthropic rules and toss them out the back door as we take a look at the 2017 Super Camp follow-up to Wolf Cop, another Wolf Cop, even though there's still only one. And consider hitting that like button if you've ever wanted to rip off someone's back flap. Let's get to it. We open on an attractive and successful man commending us on how smart we are to entrust our well-being to him. This is, of course, a commercial for Chicken Milk Beer, a fancy new microbrew. In the subsequent events, we learn that Mr. Swallows, CEO of the parent company of the brewery, is releasing this beverage as part of a 48-hour plan related to some sort of a broadcast. They just need their alpha subject for testing purposes, and they should be good to go. We then cut to Wolf Cop chasing some guys in a delivery van. They exchange gunfire, but are only able to slow him down with a rocket launcher. They successfully jam up his ride, but not before he ejected himself onto the top of their box truck, Teen Wolf style. Elsewhere, Tina, now the Woodhaven police chief, is showing her new rookie Scott the ropes, covering all the basics like the best spot in town to acquire Slurpees. Meanwhile, Lou is busy dispatching the henchmen, and it looks like the last guy brought a knife to a wolf fight. At, uh, well, yeah. We learn from Tina that they're playing the whole wolf cop situation as a local legend, but then their worlds collide as the rolling shootout drives by, requiring them to take off in pursuit. But even though Lou finishes his business and helpfully pulls the truck over into a parking space, they barely keep up and are only able to piece together what transpired from the pieces of people that are strewn about the back. Tina immediately heads to Lou's lair to give him an earful about this. He promised to stay tucked away and also to not commit mass murder. But the evidence collected as a result of his careful and meticulous detective work imply that there's some sort of shapeshifter shenanigans going down. Then, through radio voiceover, we learn that Mr. Swallows has been investing heavily in the town's infrastructure, setting up shop in their defunct brewery and are even opening a hockey rink for the benefit of its citizens. Under this context, as they go about clearing out the massacre evidence, Mayor Rich pops over to the station to try to convince the officers that all this influx of cash is good for the town, and to try to peer pressure the officers into slamming some chicken milk while on duty. Slam I'm a cool cock! He was hoping, in light of the blood-soaked van behind them, they might make an effort to ensure there's no undue negative attention scaring off the shareholders. Back at his warehouse, Lou cracks open the package from the back of the truck and determines it to be full of goo. Wanting to make sure he provides up-to-the-minute preliminary reporting, he turns his back on it to check in with Tina. When he circles around, he discovers the goo to contain Willie, and they have a touching reunion. After getting wiped down, Willie tries to recount what he can remember about the shapeshifter abduction and imprisonment. With its abundance of bulbous shafts and enthusiastic probing, he has a momentary crisis. How long was I gone for? about what he missed while he was in stasis. But he has to run off when his GI puts him at risk of evacuating some goo into his gitch. Back at the evil lair, we see they're in the process of tuning up a special automaton they want to unleash on the town to keep the law busy while they do their thing. So while Lou is out at the local donut shop slash convenience store looking for some supplies for Willie, Frank arrives at the local gentleman's club, the patrons of which pay him no mind due to the variety of distractions already available to them. Lou returns to his den so he can be secured ahead of his transformation. While he goes through his normal changes in defiance of standard lore, Willie, we learn, is in the bathroom losing the battle with his lower colon. We also see that Frank is in the process of starting some trouble downtown. So while Lou settles into an uneventful evening of medical dramas, Willie wakes up feeling somewhat better until he finds he has a new friend who's talking to him, which is a bit surreal. He decides to head out in search of some duct tape, but runs into his unrequited love, Tina. In the interest of regaining her trust after what his shapeshifter did, he comes clean unzipping his coveralls and giving her a friendly how-do. Meanwhile, the rookies have responded to the call at the strip club where they meet Frank, who we find shows mercy when his scanner reveals that Scott is similarly with a pupil stage worm child. Tina intends to handle this on her own. However, while Willie works to control his new appendage, Lou deputizes him and hitches a ride to the club. When they enter, they discover that Frank is impervious to gunfire and can also take quite a bit of punching and clawing. Despite the mounting evidence that they will be unable to damage him, Tina decides that double pistolas is the way to go. But as we come to learn, fire is really the only option here. Tina then stays behind to clean up the mess while Willie tries to find help for Lou's pulverized face. He visits his sister Kat, who crushes up some moon rocks and, by his certified faith healer's orders, administers 
administers it via his sinuses, and then recommends some rest. Back in Woodhaven, Tina is working on putting together pieces of evidence, and comes to the realization that the recent happenings must be somehow related to the also recent popularization of chicken milk. Lou and crew decide to continue to heal while drinking, and Willie regales him with tales of he and his sister's upbringing as she presents to Lou from the bar. They have to leave shortly after arriving when Willie's new friend starts acting up. He tries to relax at home and see if getting slick Willie high might take some of the edge off. But then he gets edged up again when Lou and Cat return and make it painfully obvious that it's going down for real. Sure enough, Cat strips down twice, acquainting us with her true persona, and they get to it. Willie tries cranking the volume to drown out their passionate noises, but the broadcast has an impact on young Willie, who starts to spaz out and threatens to burst forth from his hole. Meanwhile, back in town, the mayor arrives at what he assumes to be a hockey rink and slams a cold cock in excited anticipation of receiving his briefcase of money. But, pregnant with the chicken milk, swallows hits him with the magical frequency that calls forth his tummy buddy, although his does not start out nearly as bro-like as Willie's. We also see the police were there to investigate, and Tina makes the call to retreat. However, Daisy doesn't respond quickly enough, resulting in her getting nabbed. Back at Cats, before they can finish wallowing in their post-coital musk, Willie calls them out for some assistance. He's trying to pin down Slick Willie, who is transformed into a more negative version of himself. Lou successfully distracts him with his supple neck skins, allowing Cat to shoot him off. Cat immediately recognizes this as a baby shapeshifter, meaning that huge trouble is brewing. Then Lou gets the call from Tina, essentially confirming that trouble has already boiled over. So as the whole town prepares for the season opener, Tina gears up for a huge bust. They need all the force they can muster, so in the absence of a full moon, Willie breaks out the moon rock. They arrive at the big game, slipping incognito into various undercover positions. Swallows then steps up to the podium to provide his opening statement about how blessed they all are to have him interested in their little loser town. He then introduces them to their new home team, and they all ready up for the opening bell. This involves Oregano performing the anthem in conjunction with one of those little broadcasting devices. The resulting effect is an entire audience succumbing to severe bouts of bubblegut, which could be viewed as a commentary on his performance. As the children emerge, the game proceeds as normal, but not for long. Willie busts into the announcer's booth to shut down the transmission and destroy the organist. At the same time, Lou reveals himself on the ice and they work to clear out the townsfolk. High as hell on that moon dust, Lou then impales a couple of hockey gents and then pulls his significant back flap off another. On the sidelines, Tina wrestles briefly with whoever this was supposed to be before Willie shoots her off. Then, while in an action lull, they are distracted by the fact that Daisy is still being held hostage, while Swallows sends out the rest of the team. This requires Willie to borrow a fan's sight so he can crush up a heaping helping of moon dust to keep Lou going. He lucks out and that this isn't just a prop scythe, and he's able to use it to eviscerate the rest of the team. Unfortunately, that one lady shows back up in a rink tank and slowly approaches. Elsewhere, Tina catches up with Swallows to arrange the return of his hostage. She stands him down, and he gives Daisy back, but then reveals the whole place is wired to blow. So if she wants a chance at survival, she is required to let him leave. While back on the rink, Lou is getting torn down with a 50 cal, and is about to be slowly crushed under the tank's treads. But he is saved at the last moment by Cat who is a wolf, which is part of the Canid family, and that bugs me probably way more than it should. While Lou is revived on a double shot of moon dust laced moonshine, the cheerleaders get their arcs concluded with a sloppy murder on the ice. Then Tina and Daisy return to everyone having a good, hearty belly laugh, and she explains the situation to them so they can run out right as the whole place goes up in flames. Then they all crack open some cold ones and just watch the place burn. When morning comes, we find that they've been doing this all night, and then they all agree to drive off to a bar where they can continue their celebration celebration of definitive plot closure. But as we drift off to sleep with the credits rolling, we're treated to a mid-credits scene, where we observe as the henchman from the first movie who lost his face is being released from hospice after a fresh transplant surgery. He's looking like a million bucks. Unfortunately, as he steps out to take his shuttle, he's smeared over the concrete by Wolf Cop, providing us the closure that we so dearly desired. I have a website set up where you can support the channel through donations or merch. Just a quick note that I've added an uncensored review of Under the Skin as another benefit for donation. I'd like to give a huge thanks to my donors memorialized in the Hall of Headshots. I 
don't know, I liked Wolf Cop a great deal, and I certainly appreciate what the director was going for with the sequel. I'm just not sure that trying really hard to be intentionally bizarre is good enough for a sequel to a film that was much more grounded, especially when that's part of what made the original so good. Also, I got a sense that maybe Lowell Dean didn't really get what made the original film popular, or possibly misunderstood how to capitalize on it. For instance, in the original, there was a brief scene where Willie tried to convince Lou to drop his gitch. It was a pretty funny and charming scene, but was also natural and unforced. It seems Dean took the approach saying, oh, you like to hear about gitches? Well, you're in luck because the sequel is going to feature them prominently in a variety of areas, and it gets to be a bit much and sucks a bit of the fun out of it. If you enjoyed the video, I'd love for you to become a part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching.